Look who's back. Uh, are we on? <laughs> yes, we're on. How are you, Patrick? Uh, I'm doing well, Mark. Yes, you are. You look different. You sound different. Everything's different about you. Thank God. Um, I was thinking uh, it's been almost exactly two years since our first interview. You were a different person that first interview. Yeah. I mean, I think like the first one was the one, right? Um, that was the craziest one, right? Or the second craziest one? Well, I don't know if that was the craziest one. Yeah, you got a little crazy. That was like the first week. And then I think we, we chronicled that <laughs> right up to the, like the end of the second I month. I think more than anyone I've interviewed, you laid it all out. You, I mean, you aired your dirty laundry for everyone to see. Yeah, that's interesting. Maybe we can start talking. Like, um, I still remember like being out there, right, right out here before that and um, like wondering if this was even real, you know, because it seems like we were out there for a while and I was with people that were getting high when that had no money and literally it was like. Because this was not your typical stomping grounds. It was more Figueroa Street. No, I mean, I've been around here plenty too, um, but just the, the fact that, yeah, you're gonna go in here and do this interview and then just, the fact that you, the fact that you knew who I was and that you wanted me to come do the interview, I was still thinking that maybe the people- Were you aware of my channel? I, I had discovered it that very morning. Okay. With Amber, with a girl, you know, a girl that I was hanging out with, right. that you had interviewed her and, uh, and she's like, you wanna you want do an interview today? And I was like, yeah, yeah, whatever. And then I wound up here, you know, because she told me to be here at a certain time. And still, I was thinking maybe she was just trying to scam me. No, Amber's you know? brought me a lot of great people. Yeah, Amber's a great friend. So I know that, you know. Um, but at that time, I was out of my mind. And uh, but, I, but the part that the reason why I bring it up is I remember coming in here and just something inside me saying, screw it, like, just do it, you know. And uh, you mentioned... I don't know, like, there was something of a cry for help in that, I think. I, I remember we talked about during that first one. Show what I like. That, the idea that people would maybe stay sober after talking about it like that. I don't know, the whole thing is just, you know, it was, it, it made me kind of, it, it, it affected, it, I think overall it's affected me in a good way. You know, like I discovered for the first time in my life, um, that like people still love me a lot of people love me even more knowing everything you know that's the one thing i've seen yeah you know common sense would tell you to not go public with all this right. humiliating embarrassing crap you've gotten into right but what i've learned is yeah. when somebody airs all their embarrassing stuff that they have gotten into that the reaction from the viewers from the world is that this person needs our help or deserves our compassion. Yeah. Rather than if you're hiding it, you can kind of sense that. Right. You, you don't know necessarily what they're hiding. Yeah, you don't know what they're hiding and you don't know who they are, you know, and... And you can sense that they're yeah. not divulging everything. And I think addiction, more than anything, or, you know, I think in, in, with addiction, the disease of addiction, like that brutal honesty, is you know like crucial to, to overcoming and so like accepting myself as you know like i have this thing you know i'm an i'm an addict um <clears throat> and that's it like take it or leave it and it, and it, it was like the beginning of like the end and I, I don't know if it's ever the end end because it always sort of like the ego always rebuilds and there's always going to be a sense of like uh caring what people think I, um, but it's so, so much less than it was before um, where I was trying to be two people, you know, and I was trying to pretend like I, that I was just like a normal person and I would never want certain people in certain areas of my life, like work, for example, to know. Um, so, yeah. And, and the, but then it also there was a period of time where <clears throat> I mean, I know that part of part of my deal and I think it's, I'm probably not the only one that that's you know, in addiction or recovery or whatever. Um, part of addiction, I think, is I have a brain that uh, is very susceptible to believing delusional, untrue things, right? <laughs> like, that's part of the deal, you know? Like, like the disease is in my brain. Um, and 
part of my particular delusion when it comes to like this experience, you know, cause I did all those videos and then there was, then they were, they were popular and there was a ton of comments. And, uh, I was thinking for a while there, like, especially when I remember when I went to the East coast for a few months, I was thinking like, Oh, you know, like, God put this whole thing together and I'm going to be like famous. I'm going to be like famous as like through this and make money and, and save the world. Right. Like I was thinking that I was even thinking, Oh my gosh, like, uh, you know, we, we, I had the idea in my head that maybe I would like get a car or something and like drive back across the country from, from Boston, stopping at places along the way where fans would be and like, <laughs> and, and do my own YouTube channel and uh yeah, i don't know man um we all get that, caught up in delusional that was, thought that was it was yeah, it was weird you know it was, it was, it's just like weird if i think about some of the stuff i would think um yeah but anyway it's been a while now you know i think the last time i was here was uh over a year ago I get a lot of emails. Asking, yeah. What's going on with Patrick? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a there's a there's a Reddit uh, thread out there. Do you know about that? There's a there's a software underbelly Reddit thread. No, I just, can imagine what's on there. Yeah, actually, it's, it's, that's all right. A lot of these different topics, and uh, and then so when I did, so so, you know, I did make some friends. Like I did I did like meet people through this. Like not too many, a handful, and uh, most of them. I think only one person I met through this that I actually met in person but a few others that i uh were, were uh, am friends with i'd say like through, through text and uh what, email or whatever <clears throat> and uh one of them um reached out to me and she was really happy when i responded because there was a the rumor that i was dead mm-hmm. on the reddit or somewhere in the comments or something mm-hmm. and then she's the one that told told me about this reddit thing and so I went to it and that was fascinating. I like, I like went through the whole thing looking for me, you know, and there's a couple, there's a couple little, little, not, too, they weren't too extensive, but topics that were like about me specifically <laughs> and that I was dead. And then I, I responded to a couple of them. And, you know, when you respond, uh, people be like, ah, I don't believe it's you. <laughs> All right. But I, you know, since I've been so, so I'm sober, obviously, um, I've been sober for a little over nine months right now. How'd you do it? Um, Through yeah. the program? Yeah, so I'm in a 12-step program. That's like the, the foundation of my life. Um, but I've been in 12-step program, you know, for years. Um, it got really bad. You know, I was here in September of, what, the, what year are we, 22 now, 21. I think I was playing in a golf tournament the day after that. And uh, we didn't qualify. It was a qualifier. <laughs> and I remember like on the 11th tee, we were playing terrible. And I said, screw, cause I, already, I always had it in my head. I don't know if I came out and said it like totally honestly, but I was gonna get high again for sure. You know, it was the plan. And uh, I, I, think did, you, I think you said that. Didn't know when I had, you know, I was like sort of like uh, trying to stockpile free time and set it up, you know. Um, but then when, because if we qualified for that tournament, then the, then the tournament itself, which we had won in the past, so it, was a, it mattered to me, it was gonna be like three or four weeks later. And so I think I had it in my head, like not like you can plan these things out really, but to, to my own, <laughs> to the best of my planning at that time, to maybe get high after the tournament. But then when we weren't gonna qualify, it seemed like for sure we weren't, I decided that I'm, getting, I'm doing it tonight. You know, I'm doing it tonight on the 11th tee. And then we, then we go on a run and like, play really good and get to the like the 18th hole where we're, we're right on the edge of qualifying right on the edge and we, and we didn't <laughs> and so then I went then I, I went on an, another you know I got high of some more so you were playing after getting high no 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 we, we, did, we didn't qualify for the tournament so the golf thing was was done and then you did and that night you know I, I got high for I can't remember the details of that the one thing I do remember about coming back out here and getting high again um, was I, I ran into the guy who jumped me. Remember the guy who jumped yeah, me? Yeah, you, you, you know his you name. Got I don't know if I should say his name on here. It's not his real name, probably. No, it's not. Yeah, but uh, yeah, so like I, I came in here and did an interview right after getting jumped over here, right? I actually just drove by to, here to show 
the, the, my friend that came with me. Um, so now I'm down here again, you know, right over here for however long, a few days. And uh, I was interacting with people that are in the circle of that same guy. And he, next thing you know, he's like, I think I was in someone's tent or whatever. One of the, like some bigger one, like it's like a, and uh, he was there. And we, we sort of, we realized, he, I think he, I'm sure he knew it was me. And then, but it was beautiful because he like apologized and I like forgave him and we were cool. That's great. You know, and uh, I could, I, it was meaningful to me. And I, I don't think he was, I don't think he was BSing me. Like it was meaningful to both of us. He felt bad, you know. Well, he's just trying to survive. Exactly. I from right right from after that, like you were a target. Yeah, I, I get it. Like you oh, almost yeah. have to do that, you know. I if I I, I would, sure I would have done the same thing if I could, well, well, you know. And so I get, we, so we were able to do that. We were able to like shake hands and and be friends to whatever extent, you know. And that was cool. You know, things like that, are, are, uh, are pretty cool. Um, anyhow, I sobered up for not very long at all, um, like in November, October, November, the last of that year. And then, uh, went back to work after being off for like 10 months. You're still at the same job. I am. Yeah. After all this time, what a great boss you've got. Still that job. Yeah. Uh, like it's, it's a blessing. And, um, I know there's been a lot of comments about like how could that how could uh, how could I still have that job? And I don't disagree. You know, uh, I don't deserve it. Um, you know, and and I I I don't know for a fact. I mean, I do know for a fact in some cases, but I'm just under. I just assume that everybody there knows about this now. Like they've all seen the videos now. Like it, it gets around, and I've talked to people directly about it, and. Uh, and I'm cool with that too. Like that's probably good, you know. But I did uh, relapse again one more time after going back to work, um, and it was the worst one of all. Like, like as far as, like I was just so. I don't know how close I was to actually dying, but that's I really wanted to, like more than ever. Now there's a lot of crack addicts that are dying. I, I really wanted to fentanyl. Die. You know, I, I did have that fentanyl overdose. You know, that we've already talked about here. Um, but like January, February, and into the beginning of March, um, you know, I, at this time, you know, I, I had, you know, I lost my apartment in the beginning of, you know, like that first couple months where we were doing the videos, that's where I lost my apartment. So I didn't have an apartment ever since way back then. So I didn't really have a place to live, you know. Went back east, came back here. I was like staying with my mom and then I moved into a sober living house. I was living in a sober living house when I had that final relapse. And uh, so you get kicked out of there. Those aren't, it's not like my apartment that's just sitting empty. <laughs> I'm a sober house and I just don't come home and then, you know, they box up all your stuff and that's it. So I didn't have a place to live, you know, and I'm, I'm uh, you know, I got a storage unit. You know, I remember, um, like having a bunch of boxes in my car and I'm on the streets uh, in Pomona. Um, just so done, you know, didn't care about anything. I was, uh, you know, doing crack and meth and uh, started, discovered angel dust PCP, um, which is just like, that's a whole nother thing. I, I didn't do that much, but at the very end I was doing that. It just puts you completely in the, the way I, it's like it's like your it's like your brain I, it's almost like I feel like my brain is turning into liquid and like draining out you know just I thought I was I thought I was dying like it was you just have these uh, just hallucinations and just hope to die you know I, I was uh, I remember I was in Pomona and I, the one thing about it too and this has always been true about my using is that I never want it to I never want to go to sleep like I never want you know, like it, maybe it's been four days and I'm so tired. It's like, give me some, let me find some drugs so that I could stay awake. Because I think I don't want to, because it's like fantasy, right? It's like my life, is, I'm, 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 I'm on a death wish, you know, suicidal sort of state. But I'm numb and it's fantasy and it's not real. And once I sleep and wake up, then it's, then it really, the reality of it hits me, I think. Um, 
you know, my girlfriend found me like laying unconscious on the sidewalk in Pomona one day, you know, and I vaguely remember, you know, you know, she's little, you know, trying to like lift me up, get me into her car. So that's kind of like how I was living, you know, in March, you know, and I think I hit you up for money, you know, a couple times there, you know, like left 20 bucks, whatever, anything, uh, just so I could keep it going. Um, I was crazy, man. And somehow I wound up in rehab. Uh, I have a lot of people who love me, I'm grateful for that. A lot of that um, came from, you know, like the majority of my friends really, other than family, uh, is from the program. So from going to meetings for how all, all those years, I have very, a bunch of very close friends. And one of my, one of my closest friends, a, an older guy named Steve, he's like family to me. Um, and he, he, has, he has the attitude that a lot of people have, the attitude that I hope to have and, and continue to have, which is I'll do anything to help you. Unconditional, I don't care how many times you, I don't know how many times you blow it. And- uh, Is that what's required? with a drug addict who's just repeatedly self-destructing to have just an unlimited amount of forgiveness and understanding and patience um, because a lot of families are just like enough of this. I don't know that it's tough love. Well, not from the family necessarily. No, I don't, I don't think this is my opinion here. So not that I, not that this is for sure true. I don't know that that's required, but I, I do believe that that's available. Maybe not from the family, you know, like I do have that from my family, which I'm really grateful for. Um, but people in the program, like, like I will hope and I like, that's how I feel right now that if I'm helping someone, like someone that's in that, that position, that I will always be like that with whoever. And I've found that the people in the program, like my friend Steve that I'm mentioning here, or, and there's a lot of people like this, like Flavio came with me today, um, that they will be like that towards me because that's part of my recovery. Like the people that have been there and, and gotten clean themselves, we understand. How could I ever, um, you know, like tell somebody, okay, enough's enough, I'm not gonna help you anymore. You know, like, like the unconditional love and stuff is, that is part of the deal. That is part of the, uh, of the recovery community is that we, 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 can, we, we always believe, you know, like I, like if I can get it, you know, and, and not that I've arrived, you know, I'm still in the beginning, but if, if any, some of us that have been, some of our stories are so crazy. And if, if any of us can get it, all of us, can, anybody could get it, you know, but what happened with me is I wound up on Steve's couch because like that was part of a, that's part of his relationship and his, his approach is like, you know, you could stay on my couch and, uh, you know, like what I should have been doing was like trying to get into a program, right? You could always try to get into a program. Like anybody can, I think, try to get into a program somehow. But I was literally so out of it and so just like depressed and physically hammered and tired that what I wound up doing was not that. What I wound up doing was like laying on Steve's couch and, and like when he asked me, is it cool if I call programs for you? Saying yes, right? And so he did, and he wound up dropping me off at one. Um, and uh, it was like this, this residential little rehab. And um, I remember I was there, and I, I had gone back to work, and then I had missed like I don't know a few weeks now of work. But I, but I, you know, I had vacation time or whatever. Like I was still getting paychecks every two weeks. Like you, you know, I would always get paychecks every two weeks for a few cycles or a couple cycles. I remember I was at that place and then payday came, right? Because that's the thing, like, like I'm, what I'm using, it's like I spend all the money. And you know, when I get more money, that's what I do with it. And so I remember I was at that place when more money came. And I remember like, I lasted like about a day before I told them the truth, you know, like, hey, I'm leaving, <laughs> you know? And there's this, there's this girl working there. She's really, I, I stay in touch with her. She's a great, like she, uh, she had a good, really good sort of style of helping people. And um, she was the one there as I was packing up my stuff. And we, we both knew what I was doing. I was, I was straightforward with her and she got it. She understood, you know. And I got an Uber and Ubered back down to Pomona and got high, you know, for a couple more days. And then 
wound up going back into that place. And, uh, and, but then my time there ran out and then they transferred me to another program that had a sober living house sort of like relationship. So that I, I had a bed in a sober living house and a spot in a rehab program on the other side of town out by LAX. And uh, so depressed. All I wanted to do was sleep. So I remember sleeping in the car the whole way there, going through the check-in, like, look, this isn't gonna work, you know? Go, going into this, this house, and uh, it, was the two, it, it, it was two weeks later, because it like, occurred to me, oh, I'm getting paid tonight. You know, I think it was gonna be the last money that was gonna come in. And I'm over in Westchester, um, which is like, you know where that is, right? So it's like- By the airport? It's like a, it's kind of easy to get from Westchester to South Central. Oh yeah. Without a car, you know, there's like, there's like <laughs> boulevards that run right there. You could so probably already, it's, it's already like, okay, here's, here's what I'm doing. Like, uh, I got to just wake up at like two in the morning or whatever and just go, go, go to an ATM and go. And that was my plan. Um, but this house, they, they, uh, they, so they sort of forced us all to go to a 12 set meeting that night, you know? So, okay, whatever. I, it's walking distance. I walk down the street and, uh, I sit through this meeting and I've been in, hundreds, if not thousands of meetings. So, uh, you know, I know the drill. Um, that didn't look good. I think I probably had like 10 days sober at that time, just sort of physically, physically sober, which I was trying to sleep away, you know? And uh, they have a thing at some of these meetings where they'll ask, like, does any, they call it a burning desire. Like, does anybody, does anybody feel like if, like, like they really want to get, you know, drink or use or hurt themselves? Like now's the time to talk about it. And I thought, like, well, yeah, I, do. I was thinking to myself, I do, and I'm gonna. I'm like, why not? Why not do the thing? Like, why not say it? Like, this is the time for that. I'd never done that before. Cause I'd never felt like I, I'd never felt like that. I'd, I'd never been in a meeting where they asked that question and felt like the answer was yes. And so I raised my hand and I, I talked about it. You know, I told them, yeah, you know, like, this, like all I wanted, you know, all, like, this sucks. All I wanna do is get high. You know, and uh, that's what my plan is to do tonight. And, um, you know, what I really wished I had, and I'd mentioned this to them, is I wished that I had the desire to be clean, but I didn't. You know, like that would have been nice. Um, anyway, I said that, and it was sort of like, people still remember that to this day. Like I still go to that same meeting. Like every, like I literally haven't missed a week. But that night, you know, I literally had been living in this house for, like three hours. So I hadn't even slept there for one night yet when that first night happened. And, and I walked back to the house and that was sort of like an icebreaker moment for some of the dudes that were there that I didn't know at all. And, and uh, I went to sleep and like forgot to wake up, I guess, or slept through the night and I woke up in the morning and I had something of a desire to be sober that next morning. Um, but I, so this is me my long, I, answer, I, I realize I answer questions in a really long-winded way. <laughs> like you asked, how did how'd you do it? And uh, I don't really feel like I did it, you know? Um, like I didn't really, I don't, think it's, I, I don't think it's possible for me to create my own surrender. Like, like I woke up the next morning feeling different. I can't really take credit for that. Um, but I also was in a position in my life now at that point where I was grateful not to like be compelled to go get high, um, but I had nothing going for me, like like the, in the traditional sense, you know, like it was, I had, I had been so destroyed by this thing now that I didn't really care anymore um, in, a, in a deeper way than I had ever felt before. Uh, I had nothing left to hold on to. Um, you know, when people, when a lot of guys come into programs or get sober, it's like they want, we, because we, I'm, I'm in the same boat, we want like the things of life to build back up as quick as possible. Like get, our own, get my own place, get a girl, get a car, you know what I mean? Get back in. Uh, and I had already like experienced getting those things back and, and uh, I didn't care about that sort of stuff. Uh, I didn't know if I had a job anymore and I didn't really care about that either. Um, and that's the truth. Like uh, one thing I, one thing I, discovered or, or I know that I believe is that if I'm sober, it doesn't matter if I have that job or 
any specific particular job because if I don't, I'll just get another one. And if I'm getting high, then it doesn't matter. Like I'm not gonna, you know, I'm gonna You're blow gonna keep it. it. Yeah. So the so that doesn't matter. So anyway, I was in this. I was sort of in this state, and in the beginning, it was really like, really clear to me that uh, it was almost like I, I was almost like I was in extra innings. Like I was in a really good, peaceful mood, you know. And I would, I would, uh, I was living in a house with a bunch of younger guys. A lot of guys that were you know, struggling with even like a lot of guys that probably didn't even want to be sober at all. And I understood that, you know, like I'm like the, I'm like the old man now, you know, when I started trying to get sober and going to rehabs when I was in my early twenties, now I'm in my forties. I've been, I've had so many of these experiences. And so I had a really good experience there with those guys sort of being like a big brother or an uncle, you know, I did a lot of dishes and, and, uh, helping those guys out but I would just like get up in the morning and like get in the van and go to rehab and then come back and it's like I didn't learn anything new at rehab I've been there you know but just my attitude got better and better and as I tried to help other people and just go with it and uh, uh and then I'd come home at night and I'd, and I'd go to one of the meetings and um I, I would go to the same meetings every week which I still do to this day and you know I it's just it's, it's like simple formula like anyone that's really tr made any bit sort of an effort to get sober in 12 step sort of environment you know knows they knows what they tell you to do go to meetings get commitments you know get like be of service at the meetings volunteer to do stuff uh, get what they call a sponsor and go through the and actually go through and do the 12 steps um helping others seems to be a huge component in this helping others is probably the most important thing right um honesty is helpful yeah yeah and and, and, and the self-worth you need yeah. is important. Yeah. My honesty, you know, and then people like, if, like they find out about these videos and that just kind of gives, I mean, like, I, I guess I, in the, like the rehab world or especially like in the hardcore drug world, like of the, of the dudes and like, there's like a, there's like a certain level of like respect and you know, people have first seen me, like there's a couple of guys at this, at this particular program. I've, I'm good friends with a few people that I went through there with cool, cool people, but different backgrounds. A lot of like, sort of harder core upbringings, gang, you know, gang type stuff, like, like hardcore dudes, right? That got caught up in drugs and, and, they, and more than one person has told me like when they first see me, they figure, oh, well, I'm not gonna talk to that guy. Yeah, that guy's like a, he's probably like an alcoholic, uh, you know, that it got caught at work at his corporate job. And then they hear my story or if they happen to watch like the first video, then they're like, oh, wow, you're the real deal. And there's like a, there's like a level of connection you know, like a level of like sort of this guy gets it. Respect. Like, I, like we could talk about like we could talk about like hookers and, and crack and meth and heroin, you know. Uh, so <laughs> I'm not here, like, like I'm proud of it. But um, so I don't know what to say other than that. Like, like I, I was brought to a place of surrender deeper than ever, different than ever. Right. And and uh, like I had like, you know, what did that uh, drugs and alcohol did that. Not, not me. And at that place of surrender, uh, I believe that I was able to find a connection with, like a spiritual connection with God, or however you want to word it. Um, like I've been able so far to do a somewhat good job of maintaining that. I don't think, I don't believe that we can create it, but I believe that once it comes, that we, there's things that we can do to maintain it. Uh, and that, and that the 12, the 12 step program is like tailor made for that. And there's a lot of, there's, there's some sort of personal work involved in going through that process of, of, of kind of like doing some writing and listing, you know, um, like resentments and like pretty much like opening up your whole self, you know, seeing some of the ways you tick, um, but then continuing to go, continue to be of service and continuing to know that like, I have a brain that has proven Reuben, that it always goes back to the first crack hit. Like I'm never, I'm never into, I'm never getting myself into the position where, like I can trust my brain, right? And that's that's been a particularly difficult thing for me, because in a lot of other areas of life, like trusting my brain has proven to be like the way to solve problems. Applying that to this has literally made it last 20 years and get worse and worse and worse, you know. For this problem, like to the best of my ability, what I need to do is 
is try to put myself in a, in like a, a, a position of openness to, to outside help, to spiritual help, to direction from others, direction from others that I probably wouldn't want to take directions for in a lot of areas, you know, but just like doing that. Uh, and like, I haven't had the desire to get high. You know, I have not had the desire to get high one time in the last nine months, which that's, that's what I need. I don't like, I don't like, there's no way of describing to you what that feels like. You know, I can't, I don't think I can, I don't think I can go through life like with some like method of resisting if that comes, that obsession. What I need is for it not to come. And my experience and what I believe is happening is that the, like, like the, the surrender thing that happened to me and then like continuing to stay in it like, I've, like, I'm, like I'm doing, it has a, it, something about that, it's kind of, it's, I don't know exactly how it works, but something about that keeps it away, keeps the obsession away. Um, and your self-worth increases as you do it. Yeah. Oh, for sure. And protects you from falling yeah. back into it. Yeah. Like, like uh, and, and, and then being able to just to be myself, to be honest, like I'm not perfect. Like I do a bunch of stuff, you know, but, but I pretty much always honest about it, you know? And uh, I remember when, uh, I remember when I came in here a couple of times, I think I did a couple videos like physically sober, but not, you know, not, yeah, you reco were. not recovering or not really recovering. And it was really hard. Like there was a big fear of being honest, you know, like the, like the crack and being high is like a like truth serum, you know, like <laughs> screw it, you know, here we go. Um, but then coming in here without that, it was hard. You know, like I was, I was afraid, uh, but I do not feel afraid right now. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's peaceful. It's, it's, it's sweet. So it's wonderful. Yeah. And I, and I stayed in that area. So like I, uh, uh, I, was, I had such a good experience and I was plugged into that, that fellowship, that particular local fellowship there, um, that when my time at that program was up, because I had insurance, you know, um, I, I saw some comments, yeah. sometimes it's like, I see comments and I want to defend myself against them, but like, like one of them was like, like, oh, this guy's parents paid for so many rehabs. My parents haven't paid any money for me, for any of the rehabs I went to, but I had insurance in it and then they, they, they pretty much dictate when the program's over. And at that point, I, uh, I was able to stay in that area. Like I was able to get a little studio, literally a five minute walk from that, that sober living house in Westchester. I still live there today, although I need to move out, but that's a total sidebar thing. <laughs> the landlord needs to remodel it. But, um, and so I'm still going to, in that same sort of routine, you know, same, same sort of routine. Uh, yeah, yeah. What's the most important lesson you've learned? Um, that's a good question. I usually don't know what's best for me. And same sort of idea from another angle. What I often, what I think is best for me isn't. And that God's real, man. Just when I had given up hope, I got another chance to be alive and it was different. You know, Right around my birthday, my birthday's in February. So last year, February would have been towards the tail end of that last using spell where it was like mentally and emotionally was like by far the bottom, by far. And I was in a hotel room. I didn't have a place to live, you know, and I hadn't really seen anybody. I was just there by myself, just wanting to either like take another crack hit somehow or die. And I remember my dad found out where I was and came and I love my dad, man. He's like probably my best friend. Like I love him. He loves me too. But he basically came there and in a, in a way, I don't want that to sound morbid or weird, but it, I understood what he, what he meant. Cause he like gave me permission to die. He came in there and he told me he understands, you know, like, like it must be so awful to deal with this. And I was like, yeah, that was sort of like the way I looked at dying was like a total relief from this life. And, uh, you know, I would, I would tell him, he, I would tell him, I wouldn't really tell anybody else this, like this sort of thing, but like, like, you know, when I die and everyone's really sad and I know you're going to be sad, I'm sorry, but I want you to, to realize and be happy for me, you know? And he understood that something with my relationship with him, and, but he came in there and told, told me like, he's like, you know, if you kill yourself or whatever, it's like, I, I get it, you know? 
Um, so it was kind of a deep moment. And, and my response to that, although I heard it and I remember it now, it, it just comes to mind. But my immediate response for that, that deep father-son moment was to ask him for 20 bucks so that I could get some more crack, you know, which he didn't give me. <laughs> Yeah. It's so hard for the families. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, like, uh, gotta stay humble. Gotta do my best to stay honest. I still do believe that this experience with you and, and this whole thing, um, that like I discovered or we discovered the, the, the power of brutal, of brutal honesty and that like if there's some sort of like, like a lesson or something that others can can get from this um, or that 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 we can use when we try to help people that are that are, that are getting sober themselves is, is to encourage that the honesty the full on 100% here's everything kind of honesty that helps like there's a power in that it takes a load off your shoulders right there's great power in that there's great connection in that and and, and acceptance you know, of, you know, this is me, you know, like I'm capable of some of the most, like I, I used to, if I used to have like flashbacks of like some of those things I did, you know, I would really be so disgusted with myself, especially with the, uh, like abdicating all responsibility for self-support. Like here I have, it doesn't matter how much money it is, you know, like I'm a, I'm a grown up in America. <laughs> That, and part of the deal of being a grown up in America is you, you support yourself, right? You have a place to live and, and, and especially if you have, I, I don't happen to have kids or anything. And to take that and then just go and like spend all the money on drugs and hookers and, and, and that crap and get myself to the point where I have nothing. And then I would get sober again. And maybe like I, I somehow I think of this at work, like I'm, I picture myself at work and then remembering that and just being like wincing, like. Um, and no, not anymore, you know, like a part of the acceptance, like that's, that's what we're dealing with. That's what we're dealing with. And so that helps me to continue to, to, to the best of my ability. I have good days and bad days as far as, you know, being like humble and thinking of others ahead of myself, you know, um, I recently got somebody asked me to sponsor them in a 12 step program, which I'm, on, I'm at the beginning stage of like that part. Um, so that, and then like another thing. Um, I recently got engaged. Yeah. And so, um, like the other day, congratulations. <laughs> Thanks. Um, you know, I've had a, there, there's been this, my girl all these years, like the whole time, you know, that I've been here. Um, uh, in fact, this week is funny. Like this week is like two years since the first you know, seven years since I met Nancy. And uh, we dated in the beginning and then we sort of broke up and we, she always stayed in my life and we always were friends. She always loved me, you know, and she was always there, especially when I was at my worst. At your worst, she was there. Always she was there, always she was there. And I kept on thinking I didn't want that, you know, and everyone that I know, all the people that are closest to me have been telling me for years, like marry her, <laughs> like she's the best. And uh, I don't know what was wrong with me. Like, I, like when I say I don't always know what's best for me, like that is a... Is a um, it's not just you. A lot of people do this. She's, uh, she's perfect. Like, uh, I told her I was going to talk about her. <laughs> um, I, you know, I told her, I talked to her this morning and I said, should I invite everybody to the wedding? You know, like all the, <laughs> all, all the people. And she said, no. <laughs> we can't afford it. That'd be funny. Uh, but... Um, there was a moment where I realized that I'm in love with Nancy or how much I love her. Um, I don't know why it happened the way it did, but it was back last year in between, like around like the, after the time I did that last video here and I was back and forth living at like staying with my mom in Havasu. And there was this one, you know, there was a couple times where I was in Lake Havasu, Arizona and I with the itch to get high. And so I took off, you know, cruising around Lake Havasu looking for crack, which is, you, you can't find it. It's not there. Um, but there was one time where I did a bunch of meth with the people there. <laughs> so I did so much uh, that I came back to my mother's and couldn't sleep for like two days. I was just awake. And I was you know, always in touch with Nancy and, 
And uh, anyway, there was this one conversa phone conversation we had where we, we literally, and I've already, it's not like I just, you know, you, when you meet a girl, sometimes you'll have these marathon phone conversations. Like I've already known her for five years, right? And we had a, we had a conversation that was literally longer than eight hours on the phone. Like, like you know how the phone has a timer? <clears throat> where we just told each other everything. And I loved her so much after that. I don't know what, I don't know what it was about that or how my eyes were open there. Um, and uh, everyone loves Nancy. She's just... She stuck by you through the toughest points of your life. She's like my angel. Um, she loves me. She believes in me, you know. She, she always has had like a no judgment type of attitude towards the, towards the drug thing. Um, it's been hard for her. Like I put her through, I mean, she's, she's seen the more than any person that doesn't get high themselves. She's seen way more. She's seen me doing all the things I do when I'm out there. <clears throat> um, and then like, I feel like our relationship has really gotten, um, even better recently, like since the summer for, you know, like in these last months and like when I'm around her, like we just, it's great, you know. We like we enjoy the same things. You she know? never judged you when you were making your big mistakes. And all no, that. no, no, not at all. She just wanted she just wanted me to be okay. You know, she knows all of it, That's the sex of... stuff, all of it. You know, and she kind of understand. I mean, to as far as someone that isn't an addict themselves can understand, she understands. But it's like um, <clears throat> it's like she sees me uh, like for like what the what I what I could be if I was good. You know, like she sees, it's like she sees me for what I would be without the drugs and alcohol. Like, like if, it, if only the good part of me was expressing itself. Um, That's love. Yeah, you know, and, when, and we're not getting any younger. We're both in our 40s. And, uh, you know, I was able to do it. Like, I've never done this before. Uh, like, I got a ring and asked a girl to marry me. And she said yes. And now we're super excited. I'm even more excited, like. It's beautiful, and uh, but anyway, like so with with her with that happening, and that's very recent. I was on Christmas, and then with my buddy that asked me to sponsor him in the program. Um, those two things are helping me right now, currently, like this week, uh, to not be okay with being as selfish as I still am, you know, because I tend to like. I tend to see, like, I've always, my, one of the things, one of the delusions my, my brain believes uh, historically is that, like, going and getting high is, like, freedom. Like, that's freedom. You know, it's like, oh, I can do whatever I want. Wow, let's go. Uh, when, it's, when it's the most enslaving thing that a person can do. I might, but I also, like, have these ways of thinking, like, well, now I'm free from that. And so now I can, now I can like, quote, unquote, do whatever I want. And, like, do whatever I want often looks pretty selfish, you know, like, no, they're not, they're not all unhealthy things, but some of them are, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm obsessed with playing poker. I play poker all the time. Uh, I'm like an obsessive type of person, golf or whatever. But, you know, now I have, now I have a fiance, you know, and uh, hopefully we have kids, you know, and, and I have a, like a dude that's like counting on me to help him in the program. And so these are motivating me to be less selfish and to be more living my life for others, which is good because I think that's, that enhances like what it takes, you know, to stay, to stay humble and, and sober. So. Beautiful story. <laughs> Do you think people are going to like this as much as the other ones? I think this will probably be your second most popular one. Okay. <laughs> they love that first one for all the wrong reasons. It's good to see you, Mark. I'm proud of you. Good luck from here. All right, Mark, thanks.